The word of God says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And when I tell you there was liberty in the room, there was liberty in the room. The spirit of God showed up, worship was absolutely powerful, and God moved in a supernatural way. Today's message, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, I'm down for whatever. You've clicked this link because you're ready to see a shift in your life. Be sure to share it, subscribe to our channel, and make sure you experience all that God has for you as you continue to move towards exceptional living. Have an amazing day and check out the message and be blessed. John chapter 2 beginning at verse 1 concluding at verse number 5. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Verse 5, His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. I want to draw my title from verse number five, Mary, the mother of Jesus, said to the servants at the wedding reception, whatever he says to you, do it. I want to label this message, I'm down for whatever. Somebody just shout, I'm down for whatever. Yeah, whatever he says, you just do it. Take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Yeah, somebody just shout, I'm down for whatever. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a living demonstration of what's possible when God has a unique assignment for a person's life. She was a teenage virgin girl from the hood, and God chose her to give birth to the Son of God and to the Savior of the world. Can you imagine her emotional state? and the shock of her response when she heard this news, a virgin having a baby without the assistance of a man. Imagine all the adjustments she had to make knowing that her life would never be the same. Mary had to navigate the complexities of her assignment, and this was an assignment that she did not ask for. She was minding her own business, preparing to marry the love of her life when God disrupted her plans and shifted the trajectory of her entire life. Fast forward to John chapter 2, Mary and her young adult son Jesus was invited to a wedding of a couple who lived in a small village called Cana. Let the church say Cana. This village called Cana was four miles from the town of Nazareth where Jesus was raised. There are Bible scholars, Miss Tiffany, who suggest that it is quite possible that Mary and Jesus had a close personal relationship with this family. The fact that Mary advocated for this couple when they, ran out of, when they ran out of wine and the fact that Mary was able to give instructions to the servants at the wedding reception further indicates that there was a close connection between Mary, Jesus, and this couple. But I want to submit that whoever this couple was and despite their relationship with Mary and Jesus, they did not have a relationship with a good wedding planner. Dr. Johnson, I'm making this observation because based on the fact that they ran completely out of wine, this suggests that they were not prepared for their guests. They could possibly face public shame and social embarrassment. Can you imagine all of the comments on social media in Jerusalem about this couple, about this couple if Jesus hadn't stepped in? Can you imagine this couple going viral for all the wrong reasons? This would be a complete and utter disaster if Mary and Jesus had not intervened. Notice my purposeful language. I said, if Mary and Jesus had not intervened, because it would be irresponsible, Dr. Johnson, to overlook Mary's contribution to this miracle. It was Mary who initiated the miracle, and Jesus was the one who performed it. Okay, everybody's not with me. Let me wake you up and help you, up, help you out real quick. Right now, in the world of college basketball, men and women are competing in their versions of the playoff. We call them March Madness. It's interesting to see these teams who are labeled as underdog teams compete at a very high level in order to defeat teams who are more likely to win. Buzzer beaters, right? Surprise scores at the end. Just a few days ago, teams who were unranked have beaten un have beat ranked teams in what we call March Madness. Let the church say March Madness. And if a player shoots a game-winning shot, it's normal to talk about the player who won the game. 
but we overlook the person who passed the ball to the player so that he or she could shoot the game-winning shot. In this story, Miss Corinthia, Jesus turned water into wine at a reception. That's the game winner, but it was Mary who assisted him to perform this miracle. It was Mary who set up the shot, are you feeling me, to help Jesus to perform this miracle. It was Bible scholar Mary Kaloe. She says that Mary served as a midwife in this story to assist Jesus with the birthing of his public ministry. That's Mary Kaloe. She says, Pastor Gibson, that Mary was a midwife that served Jesus and assisted Jesus with the birthing of his public ministry. The same Mary that birthed Jesus into this world also helped to birth his public ministry by helping him with this miracle. Mary was the one who invited Jesus into this particular situation, which led to miraculous results. Brothers and sisters, that leads us to what we call the main thesis or the big idea for today's message. If you are a guest of ours in, in person or online, every message has what I call a main thesis or a big idea. It's one sentence that describes the entire message just in one sentence. And here's the big idea. We'll put it on the screen for you. Whenever Jesus is invited into the circumstances of our lives, we can expect to experience uncommon and unnecessary blessings. Somebody shout uncommon and unnecessary blessings. If you give me 21 minutes and 30 seconds, I'll unpack this and I'll take my seat. When Mary invited Jesus into this situation, Jesus did not respond with a sense of urgency. Look at verse 3. Look at your Bible. Verse 3 says, when the couple ran out of wine, Mary informed Jesus about this particular situation. But watch verse 4. Jesus says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Because my hour has not yet come. Now, brothers and sisters, don't, don't move too fast before you accuse Jesus of being disrespectful to his mother. You got to know that it's important that when a man said woman in this term in the Hebrew language or in the Aramaic, it was the equivalent of us saying ma'am. He was not being disrespectful. He was saying, ma'am, what does this have to do with us? That phrase, what does this have to do with us in the Aramaic literally means, what is this to me and you? Do I have some people in the building just like Jesus who will say, I just showed up at the wedding. I ain't trying to work. I ain't trying to perform no miracles. I just want to eat some meatballs and some chicken salad and watch this little reception, do the wobble one or two times, and go to the crib. Jesus said, I just came as a guest, and this ain't got nothing to do with us. When Jesus responded and asked his mother, what does this have to do with us? He was proposing a critical question, Minister Tina, that suggests, what business of this is ours? Why should we get engaged and involved? Jesus followed up that question with a simple statement that gives us the foundation for why he was hesitating about performing this miracle. He says, I don't want to get involved because my hour has not yet come. Jesus knew that if he had performed this miracle at this wedding, it would invoke premature celebration and he was not ready to be glorified because this was the beginning of his public ministry. It's all about timing. Sometimes we can know what God has called us to do, what, what God has called us to do, but we move too fast instead of operating in the timing of God. Jesus says, I know that I'm called to be the savior of the world. I'm called to be the Messiah, but my time for glorification hadn't come yet. So he says, Mama, let's pump the brakes. I don't want to perform this miracle because this ain't got nothing to do with us. Despite the initial hesitation by Jesus, Mary demonstrated what I'm called in Lamont, uncommon faith, which led to what I'm also calling an uncommon blessing. Notice what Mary said to the servants at the wedding after Jesus informed her that he wanted to stay out of the situation. It's right there in verse 5. We'll put it on the screen. Mary said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. That's a strange response. Did you notice that Jesus didn't seem very interested in helping with this miracle, but his mama said, somebody shout, his mama said, whatever he says, y'all just do it. That statement, Reverend King, was a statement of faith by Mary, but my question is, what was the foundation for her faith? Do I have any thinking people in the room? No, I'm really asking, do I have any thinking people in the room? I want to know. Ms. Tawana, what was the foundation of her faith? Because she had never seen Jesus or anyone else perform a miracle. 
She had no previous point of reference that would cause her to believe that her son was capable of performing this miracle. When the angel showed up when she was a teenage girl in the hood, the angel didn't say anything about Jesus turning water into, a, into wine or Jesus performing miracles. When the angel showed up, he simply told her that she would give birth to the Son of God. And in Mary's estimation, that was enough. So how did Mary know that Jesus was capable of turning water into wine? It's simple. Mary knew that her son was the Messiah. She knew that Jesus was God. And because he's God, I don't know what he can do, but I know he can do something. That's why she said whatever he says do. Just do it. I'm preaching to the people in this room who are trusting God to do something that you've never seen before. And if you have no point of reference, you have no previous experience about what you're praying and asking God to do, just know this simple phrase is theological, but it's also practical. Because Jesus is God, he can do whatever is necessary to pull you out of your situation. Is there anybody other than me that can testify, I ain't settling anymore for mediocrity, I ain't settling for average, I ain't settling for just enough, because the same Jesus who turned turn water into wine at a wedding can also move in the midst of every circumstance that I face. Somebody tap yourself and say, whatever he says do, I I'm ready to do it. And even if you have no point of reference for what you're expecting him to do, just know that because Jesus is God, he's capable of doing uncommon things in your life. Because whenever Jesus is invited into the circumstances of our lives, you can expect uncommon and unnecessary blessings. Y'all got it. I'm glad you're participating. Notice what I'm saying out of this text. Forgive my redundancy, but remember the statement that Mary made to those workers, those employees at the wedding reception? She says, whatever he says, just do that. Don't overthink it. Don't over." Think it, don't overthink it, don't, don't get overwhelmed, don't question it, don't try to justify it or rationalize it. Whatever he says do, just do it. And the same words that came from Mary to these servants at the wedding reception also applies to each of us. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, you got to be committed to doing it. If Jesus tells you to change your friendship circles, disconnect from someone, or change your environment so that you can have a closer relationship with him, you got to just do it. If Jesus tells you to pray more, to fast more, to go deeper in the word, and to be more faithful in church, if Jesus says you need to start tithing, if Jesus says you need to participate in Bible study, whatever he tells you to do, you just got to do it. If Jesus tells you to do something hard that will stretch your faith despite how hard it is, you got to know that the same Jesus who gave you the instructions will also give you the strength to carry out everything that he's telling you to do. Because, Minister, Minister May, when Jesus told the servants at the reception, fill up six large water pots, that was roughly 18 to 27 gallons of water. They had to carry six heavy, large water pots in order to see something they had never seen before. And here's a quick lesson that you should go home with. If you want to see what you've never seen, you got to do what you've never done. It's like picking up these six large water pots, Miss Deborah. It's hard, it's heavy, but that's your assignment for this season. And even if it's heavy and it's hard, the truth of the matter is that whenever you're expecting God to do the exceptional in your life, it will always come to those who are committed to doing hard things. You will never see God do the supernatural if you stay fixated and fascinated with what's easy. Pursuing spiritual maturity is hard. Breaking bad financial habits is hard. Going to school is hard. Starting a business and sustaining a business is hard. Protecting your mental wellness is hard. Losing weight, eating right, and working out is hard. Being committed to God in a world of sin is hard. But everybody who's committed to doing the hard things are more likely to see God do something that's easy for him. And if you stay fixed on what's comfortable and stay fixed in your place of complacency, you will never see God do what you've never seen God do. And the same way these servants at this wedding had to carry these six heavy water pots, you got to commit to carrying something heavy if you want to see God do something uncommon and unnecessary. Am I preaching to anybody in this building? Maybe they're online. But anybody can say, I got a hard assignment ahead of me, and I know that the same God who gave me the instructions, the same God who gave me the blueprint and the roadmap will also give me the necessary strength to handle a hard assignment. It's hard, but it's your assignment in this season. 
Because if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Everything you're expecting is on the other side of something hard. And if you stay focused and fixated on what's easy and comfortable, you will never see God do the unexpected, the unexpected in your life. This text teaches us that there are times in our lives when we have to do some hard things, some heavy lifting in order to participate in the miracle. But there's another turn in this text, preacher, that I want to explore because this text also teaches us that there are times when Jesus blesses, blesses us beyond what we need. He blesses us with what I'm calling unnecessary blessings. It's important to know that wine in the Bible was a symbol of joy, celebration, and abundance. They would gather and they would drink wine. They would eat, drink, and be merry. That's where that phrase come from. It was a time of celebration whenever wine was involved. But it's interesting, Dr. Johnson, that the first recorded miracle of Jesus involved Jesus turning water into wine. I think we need to explore that, and I'm glad that you're sitting here quietly with expectation because I ain't necessarily trying to make you shout. I'm trying to make you think. And if you think right, you'll get your shout right. Notice, no, notice what I'm suggesting out of this text. Because as far as we know, Miss Crystal, this was the first miracle that Jesus ever performed, but it's the only miracle in the Bible that is not attached or connected to a life-threatening situation. Think about it. When you study God's word, uh, Brother James, I almost said Minister James, Mr. James. The man of God said he's not in agreement yet. Hold on. <laughs> Brother James, when we study God's word, when we survey the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are at least 37 miracles performed by Jesus. At the end of this book, the book of John, we're told that Jesus performed so many miracles during his earthly ministry that there are no books to contain how much he did. That's what the Bible says. But there are at least 37 miracles that's recorded, Miss Deborah, in the Bible, performed by Jesus. And the majority of them were the result of severe issues or a critical medical crisis. Okay, for example, Jesus healed a man who was paralyzed for 38 years. That was a severe situation. Would you agree? Yeah. Jesus healed a woman who was bleeding uncontrollably for 12 years. Yeah. Jesus resurrected a little girl who was 12 years old who died at home. That was a severe situation. There are several miracles performed by Jesus that dealt with life-threatening issues or severe situations, like the time that Jesus saved his disciples when they were out on a storm yeah. in a boat. But this first miracle performed by Jesus was not connected to a severe crisis. It had nothing to do with a natural disaster. It had nothing to do with a medical condition. The first miracle performed by Jesus involved him turning water into wine at a reception. You're waiting on the point? Here it is. Jesus is not just concerned with what you call the important matters. He's concerned about what brings you joy. This, this is a thinking person sermon. Y'all watch this. Because water is essential. And despite how some of y'all feel, wine is not. Some of y'all looking like you don't know like I know, Pastor. So let me tell you again. Water is essential, but wine is not. But Jesus, God in human form, Ms. Ray, demonstrated his supernatural power not to heal nobody at the wedding, but to turn water into wine. And if Jesus can give this couple more wine at a wedding when somebody could have easily went to Publix in Jerusalem and got more wine, it tells me that Jesus is concerned about what brings me joy. Let me tell you why I'm teaching and preaching this message. There are people, preachers, Facebook prophets, Facebook pastors and evangelists who keep giving us this false narrative 
And I told the 9 a.m., I don't know if this is a word, but I'm going to say it, say it. It irks my soul whenever I hear it or when I see it. And here is the false theology. God ain't concerned with your happiness. He's only concerned with your holiness. I got a problem with that. Because why would God send his son to die on a cross to be crucified, buried, and resurrected so that I can be miserable? If, here's the whole point, and if y'all don't shout this, I'm going to start the whole sermon and say it all over again. If Jesus cared enough to perform this miracle where he turned water into wine at a wedding, which nobody's life was at stake, surely he wants me to be happy and blessed all the days of my life. Because what's the worst that could happen if Jesus and Mary didn't step in? The couple would have been embarrassed, but they still would have been married and they would have moved on with their lives. But Jesus is teaching us a critical lesson. I'm not just concerned with the stuff that you think is important. I'm concerned with what brings you joy. And I'll say it again and I'm done. If Jesus took the time and used his supernatural power to perform this wedding where he turned water into wine, then surely my happiness and my joy is also in his hands. Everybody who knows me knows that I preach about suffering. I preach about going through trials and tribulation because that's a part of life. But the same people who said that he's not concerned with my, my, whole, my happiness, only my holiness, that, that's a contradiction. Because he's the God of all joy. He's the God of all peace. He's the God that desires to put a smile on my face. And I'll say it again until y'all get it. And because he performed this miracle where he turned water into wine at a wedding, surely he, he's concerned about what brings me joy. You got far extreme people who will say, if you give your life to Jesus, you'll never have a problem. They stupid. Don't believe that. But on the other end of the spectrum, there are people who say, once you get saved, you got to take a vow of depression, a vow of poverty. You can't smile, can't have no money, can't live right. The devil is a lie. Jesus didn't die to save me so I can be miserable. He came that I might have life and have it more abundantly. That's what he said. And if he can turn water into wine at a wedding, Surely he's concerned about what? What brings me joy. I'm done. Everybody stay. That's all it is. <laughs> he said, keep the party going. Nobody's life was at stake at this reception. Nobody would have died if Jesus and Mary hadn't stepped in. But his first miracle, Jay, he's introducing us to the joy that comes with knowing him. If Jesus hadn't stepped in, if Mary had never given him the alley-oop, if she had never passed him the ball, everybody would have went home and still been alive. But he says, it's not just the critical things that you think I'm concerned about. He wants to be Lord over all of my life. Listen, before y'all sing that, let me tell y'all this. Because when they sing that, they're going to they be churchy and I ain't going to have no time to say this. So let me just say this. Let me tell y'all this. This passage really ain't about wine running out at a wedding. Because remember, wine represents joy. It's really about who do you turn to when your joy runs out? That's the question. The critical question is when your joy is being drained, who do you go to? Do you go to people? Do you go to drugs? Do you go to alcohol? Do you go to sex? Like, what do you go, where do you go to anesthetize the pain of not having joy? Jesus says, no matter how big it is or how small it is, just turn to me. I'll say it again for the sake of redundancy. I'm done when I say this, because if Jesus used his power to turn water into wine at a wedding, surely he cares about what brings me joy. Anybody who feels like your joy has been on empty, I dare you to start praising God 
and giving him glory for refueling and refilling your joy bucket. <laughs> yeah. Now, come on, let's go to church real quick. Everybody know this one. It's an old Kurt Franklin classic. Come on, let's just say joy. Joy, joy. God's great joy. Joy, joy. Down in my soul. Down in my soul, sweet, beautiful, soul-saving joy. Come on, say it. Y'all gotta be the come on, be the senior choir and rock. Yeah. You like the senior choir. Come on. Joy. Joy. Come on, say down in my soul. Down in my soul. Sweet. Sweet. Beautiful. So saving joy. You know the verses? You know the verses? Oh, joy. I don't need them. Joy. We ain't gonna do the verses. Okay. Say joy, joy, joy. God's great joy. God's great joy. Joy. I'm gonna be Kurt. Joy. <laughs> be Kurt. Down in my soul. Sweet. Sweet. Beautiful. Beautiful. I'm gonna say soul saving joy. Soul -saving. me. Old joy, old joy. joy. Come on, say my master's joy. Everybody say my master's. My master's joy. The master's joy. Here we go. The master's joy. The master's joy. Come on. Lily of the valley. Come on, everybody say it. Y'all help me say it. Lily of the valley joy. Come on, say food on the table. Y'all help them say it. Food on the table. No food on the table, joy. Yeah. I know that he is able. That's the next one. I know that he is able. I know that he is able, joy. In the midnight hour, say it. Y'all ready? Here we go. In the midnight hour, joy. Y'all sound like the mass choir. Come on, say. He gives me strength and power. He gives me strength and power. Joy, joy, y'all ain't watching the director. Oh, oh, joy, joy, joy. Oh, joy, come on. Oh, joy, joy. Come on, play it, brother. Joy, 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 joy. One more time, we're gonna say, oh, joy. Y'all say it with them. Come on, say it. Oh, joy, joy, in my soul, in my soul. Oh, joy, oh, joy, oh, joy, joy, in my soul. Thank y'all for coming to Mass Choir rehearsal. Thank y'all for coming to Mass Choir rehearsal. Y'all so churchy, y'all so. <laughs> That's the, that's the bravado. That's the bravado. Come on, y'all. Listen, listen. If you want to know Jesus, here's, it's simple. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. You shall be saved. Minister James May, Minister Sterling Wilson are on my right and your left. Reverend Vernon King is on my left and your right. If you want to meet Jesus today, you can come down this aisle today. Virtual campus, follow the promptings on your screen. Or if you're in the sanctuary and you don't want to walk down the aisles, just text the word CONNECT 
for salvation or for church membership. Let me see the hands of those you believe in that God is calling you to join the church. You're, you're, you're supposed to join the church today. I want to see everybody who doesn't have a church and God is telling you, you need to start off this Holy Week by joining a church. Anybody needs a church home. Anybody needs to, anybody desire to be saved, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and he'll give you everlasting joy. He'll transform your life and do some amazing things to set you on the path of purpose. If you're in the virtual campus, you can follow those promptings. You have the same opportunity as those who are in person in the sanctuary. And he'll give you joy, amen. Everybody's saved. Everybody has a church. Well, let's put our hands together and bless the name of the Lord. Take your seats.